Welcome to Blue Talks. So in August of 2023, an article came out in Time magazine titled, America has reached peak therapy. Why is it that our mental health is getting worse? I work as an educational therapist, but part of my job is also to teach future mental health professionals, future educational therapists, future counselors, et cetera. And so in my graduate classes, I have started to pose this question to my students. Why is our mental health getting worse? And um, when I do pose this question in class, students start to kind of talk about all the things that come to mind in terms of why. Obviously, we just had a global pandemic. That's the first thing that comes up for people. Um, and then there's a list. There's the list of the climate crisis and the existential kind of anxiety that that has been giving all of us. People talk about the financial crisis and how the American dream is maybe dead for some. And then, of course, there's always the wars that we're all facing that are still ongoing. And so they start to list these things off. But I then kind of push them and I ask them to think a little bit deeper because while it's true that all of these things have been happening and while it's true that the pandemic was really quite a big one, the fact is that in human history, there has always been different types of stressors in the environments. And while at the same time these things have been happening, um, our mental health field has been doing a lot more research, a lot more treatments. In many ways, mental health has entered into the culture and into the zeitgeist. There are celebrities talking about their mental health. The royals had a mental health initiative. There is athletes and politicians who now talk about their mental health in a way that people never did before. And so in many ways, we have destigmatized and more and more people are working to actually get mental health aid. And yet, even with all the self-care days and everything that corporations encourage everyone to take part in, it seems that the trends are going in the opposite direction as what we would want them to be going in. In fact, there have recently been several studies that have shown a number of different really, really big increases in the disparity between people's mental health. So one in three American adults today reports having uh, depression or anxiety. One in eight people are on antidepressants. One in 25 have a very serious mental health issue. And suicide rates are up 30% since 2000. Meanwhile, it's not any better for kids. Kids' mental health is also dramatically getting worse with suicide being the second highest, um, basically, killer of kids in our country. So I ask my students, should we not, as people who are studying to become mental health practitioners and people who are studying frameworks that are empirical, should we not be asking empirical questions? Like, are our models actually working? And when I do this, my students again want to sort of say, no, 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 it's not the models. All of a sudden, all these millennials and Gen Z students who are normally blaming the system turn into boomers and they want to defend the system. It's not the mental health models. It's actually environmental factors, such as, for example, social media. That's the top answer that they give. I do keep track of what they give because I am, after all, an empirical researcher. So social media and technology, they claim is the number one reason why we are seeing kind of the disparity and the trend that we see. And then the number two thing is social injustice. So they talk about how even though mental health research has grown, our frameworks are continuously developing, not everyone has access. So it's really the system's fault. And they say this as if 
they're not quite sure, they're not, they don't quite understand that they themselves are entering into that system. As future educators, mental health professionals, they are entering and becoming a part of that system. And then we have this whole conversation about the ways in which psychology as a field upholds these systems and the problems in these systems. And that's a, an interesting talk that we have, but it's beyond the scope of today's talk, so I'm going to skip it. But I then ask them again to dig deeper, which is what you would do when someone walks into your therapy room, right? So you acknowledge that, yes, there are many, many different kinds of societal and environmental and historical issues going on, but what is the personal responsibility that you're going to take? What is the area that you have control over? And I ask them to do the same. We as mental health professionals have to take responsibility for our jobs, our role, and our field. And the fact of the matter is that none of the empirical data currently is supporting that our systems are actually working. And it's important to recognize this. In 2019, a study came out, Psychiatry Today, which essentially said that the current system that we have for diagnosis and treatment has absolutely no scientific basis, that the DSM is essentially a subjective set of criteria, and that, you know, Many people sort of know that the, the criteria and the history of the DSM is very androcentric and very Eurocentric, which is just fancy words for sexist and racist because it's primarily been white men who have sort of come up with these uh, criteria. And so there is no biomarkers. And this is really important to recognize outside of certain, you know, more severe mental health issues. There is no biomarkers for depression, anxiety, et cetera. And so we can't be talking about mental health issues in the same ways that we do about other medical conditions. In fact, it's important to note that the trend that we see in mental health, where the more we are doing research, the more we are growing, the more people's mental health issues are also growing, does not exist in anything else. It doesn't exist in cancer research. It doesn't exist in um, diabetes. It doesn't exist in health, uh, sorry, heart disease. And so why is it that this is happening? There's a, a famous quote now that you might have heard. It is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick system. And I don't mean to sort of repeat this to say what I read some other articles say that these days people are no longer really doing any kind of reflective work on themselves because whatever happens, they're just like, oh, it's capitalism's fault, it's the system's fault, and they're not taking personal responsibility. But I actually think it's a really, really important quote to get us to interrogate our systems a little bit more deeply. Because what if we have been doing it wrong all along? What if mental health is not something that can be observed and measured in the same way that tangible things in medicine can be observed and measured, because mental health is actually an internal conscious experience. And the root of empiricism is observation and measurement, and you cannot observe and you cannot measure consciousness. So what if all of our models are wrong and what if we've been asking the wrong questions all along? Part of my argument is that that's exactly what is happening. But I then tell my students who are paying a lot of money and going into a lot of debt to become mental health professionals that that doesn't mean that mental health professionals don't have a really, really important role in society. In fact, it is my belief that this group, whether it's educators, therapists, counselors, et cetera, are going to be the most important profession in the days to come. Some of you may be familiar with Audre Lorde. She was a feminist, black thinker, writer, civil rights activist, and she was the person that first coined kind of this term of radical self-care, radical self-love, radical acceptance, all before it became sort of like appropriated the way that DEI has. But what she talks about is that 
actually all of us as healers have to take on quite a social and political role because mental health is actually social. It is not medical in the way that psychology as a field has really, really tried to convince everyone that it is. And so I believe that in the days to come, therapy is going to be political. Therapy is going to be resistance. Therapy is going to be communal and social. And we're going to have to change all the questions that we're asking and all the ways in which we're working to become mental health professionals. So in my work, in my organization, the recovering psychologists who come to me, we spend a great deal of time interrogating and looking at the history of the mental health field and of psychology. We then spend a lot of time talking about the current medical models that are in place, which are capitalist and empirical and positivist and ultimately white supremacist. And then we talk about how can we shift this so that our models can become communal and collective. Because I really do believe that another world is possible. And it's not only possible, it's actually on its way. And if we do our job right, mental health professionals, educators, counselors, all of us in the healing professions will be the midwives of that new world. So if you're interested in sort of learning the first step on how to take the, the very beginning of the journey towards shifting towards radical love and centering radical love and shifting your models in mental health practice, just go ahead and um, scan the QR code that I have here. And from there, you'll be able to um, get our, our toolkit for that first step. Thank you very much. <laughs>